Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the latest update on COVID-19 in Pennsylvania. Before I begin, however, with the daily updates, there is an important issue that I would like to address. I feel that I must personally respond to the multiple incidents of LGBTQ harassment and specifically transphobia directed at me that have been reported in the press. I would first like to sincerely thank Governor Wolf for his continued support and for his comments last week. The LGBTQ community has made so much progress under Governor Wolf and his leadership during his time in office. But I want to emphasize that while these individuals may think that they are only expressing their displeasure with me, they are, in fact, hurting the thousands of LGBTQ Pennsylvanians who suffer directly from these current demonstrations of harassment. Your actions perpetuate the spirit of intolerance and discrimination against LGBTQ individuals and specifically transgender individuals. It is only one month ago that the Supreme Court prohibited discrimination in the workplace due to sexual orientation and gender identity. But LGBTQ individuals can still be denied housing and public accommodations in most places in Pennsylvania that do not have local non-discrimination ordinances. In addition, the most vulnerable among us continue to suffer, including LGBTQ individuals of color, LGBTQ youth, LGBTQ seniors, and LGBTQ immigrants. Transgender women of color continue to not only be harassed, but are more likely to suffer violence and even murder. We have not made progress unless we have all made progress. It is in this space that these acts of intolerance live and where we need to continue to work against them. To the perpetuators of these and the perpetrators of these actions, if your apologies are sincere, then I accept your apologies. But an apology is the beginning, not the end of the conversation. I call on you, I call on you and all Pennsylvanians to work towards a spirit of not just tolerance, but a spirit of acceptance and welcoming towards LGBTQ individuals. We all need to foster that spirit of acceptance and welcoming to LGBTQ, LGBTQ individuals and celebrate the wonderful diversity of our Commonwealth. Our children are watching. They are watching what we do, and they are watching how we act. And to all LGBTQ young people, it is okay to be you, and it is okay to stand up for your rights and your freedoms. As for me, I have no room in my heart for hatred and frankly, I do not have time for intolerance. My heart is full with a burning desire to help people. And my time is full with working towards protecting the public health of everyone in Pennsylvania from the impact of the global pandemic due to COVID-19. And I will stay laser focused on that goal. Now, to continue, as of 12 a.m. this morning, we have 1,120 new cases of COVID-19. This brings our statewide total to 109,384 Pennsylvanians who have tested positive for COVID-19 in all 67 counties. Tragically, 7,146 deaths have been attributed to COVID-19 in Pennsylvania. Today, I would like to talk to you about universal testing in nursing homes in Pennsylvania. I am so pleased to share 
that all skilled nursing facilities in Pennsylvania have complied with my order from June 8th to test all the residents and all the staff in those facilities, 100%. This was an essential step to ensure that we further protect residents and staff within these vulnerable communities. Our goal with implementing universal testing in nursing homes was to rapidly detect asymptomatic positive residents and staff to prevent further spread. By completing universal testing, facilities are one step closer to achieving all of the goals set out to allow safe visitation, communal dining, and activities. I cannot underscore how large of an undertaking this was for the facilities and for the Commonwealth and the Department of Health. There are approximately 84,000 residents in nursing homes on top of the staff that support them. We provided nursing home owners and operators with the resources they need to accomplish this huge task. Through our partnership with CVS Health and Eurofins, we will continue to provide skilled nursing home facilities with access to testing services at no cost. We know testing, education, and resources are essential components to ensure the safety and well-being of the residents and staff in these facilities. Therefore, we continue to take all necessary actions to further protect our most vulnerable Pennsylvanians, many of whom reside in long-term care facilities. These efforts include the work being done by our department, the Department of Health, and the Department of Human Services, and our contractors, ECRI, and General Health Care Resources to assist facilities with outbreaks. In addition, this includes the new Regional Response Health Collaboration Program or RICP program, just established by the legislature and signed by the governor. That program is up and running. Department of Human Services is lead with close collaboration with the Department of Health and Pima. These healthcare systems will assist the long-term care facilities in their regions to address COVID-19. We will continue to provide PPE to facilities in need, which to date has involved more than 2,300 pushes of personal protective equipment, including 306,944 gowns, 336,559 face shields, 1,023,800 pairs of gloves, 2,807,570 N95 masks, and 1,175,000 surgical masks. Our work continues to ensure that nursing homes are safe places for vulnerable Pennsylvanians in need. Our surveyors have completed more than 98% of the infection control surveys required by the federal government, and we will complete the remaining 2% certainly in time to meet the July 31st deadline. If you have a concern about what is occurring in a nursing home, please speak up by filing an anonymous complaint with our department at health.pa.gov. As I have said numerous times, the prevalence of COVID-19 in our nursing homes is directly related to the prevalence of COVID-19 in the communities in which they are located. So the more the virus is spreading in the community, the more likely it is that one of our heroic healthcare workers at a nursing home may contract the virus and unknowingly spread it. So please do your part. Wear a mask. Please comply with the governor's orders in terms of the 25% in restaurants, in terms of the closure of bars and and um, and other those facilities. Uh, the 25%. Um, in terms of 25 people in terms of uh, indoor facilities. Help protect each other and help protect our communities. Now here are my daily reminders. Please wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or the time that it still takes to sing happy birthday twice. Please use hand sanitizer if soap and water are not available. 
cover any coughs or sneezes with your elbow, not with your hands. Don't touch your face, especially after touching surfaces. Clean surfaces frequently. And if you're going outside in public, whether you're indoors or outdoors, please wear a mask if you're going to come into contact with others. If you have questions about your health, always please contact your health care provider. If you need mental health resources because you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, please contact the crisis text line by texting PA to 741741 or call the statewide refer referral and support helpline at 1-855-284-2494. One eight five five two eight four two four nine four. If you or someone you know needs help with a substance use disorder, please call the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs Get Help Now hotline at one eight hundred six six two help. One eight hundred six six two help. For the most reliable information related to Pennsylvania's response to COVID-19, always please visit our website at health.pa.gov. And what is most important for Pennsylvanians to remember, stay calm, stay alert, and stay safe. Thank you. And I'm pleased to answer questions. Yes. I've read the, uh, I've read the plan for resuming visitation at the facilities and uh, it's a little hard to wrap your mind around and it's, I think it's a little confusing in terms of the various two-week periods and, uh, and then there's also that potential to reset, to reset the clock if there's an infection. To the average person who's wondering when they'll be able to go back and, and have a, a visit with their loved one, I mean, as best you can, how long will it be until people will be able to do that again? Well, the, the first thing we had to do was to complete this testing. So all the facilities had to complete their testing. That's the most necessary part. If they had no cases then, uh, of staff or residents, then they're going to progress through that, that pathway. If they had cases, they have to go back and, and start um, and then retest to make sure that they have no cases. So I, I know it, it is a, certainly an in-depth plan. Um, it, it's really designed to be read by the facilities more than the, the general public. I mean, I think the public should call the facility. They well know where they are in terms of that schema and what it's going to take to be, for them to be able to uh, allow visitors. I mean, it's a, it's a balance. At the same time that, of course, we want visitors to be able to see their loved ones uh, and their loved ones in these facilities to, to, to see their family. I mean, that's critically important. However, we know how COVID-19 enters the facilities and is primarily through asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people. And so, um, and so we have to be just so careful about visitors entering because we don't want to introduce COVID-19 into the facilities that way. Let me just ask this sure. say, say a facility um, met the, the, the July 24th deadline, and they say they had zero infections of that point, at that point. And they also felt that they could do the various other things with, um, you know, equipment and things like that. Like, so say they had zero infections as of July 24th, and they were able to maintain that. When approximately would somebody Mm -hmm. be able to make an appointment sure. and have a visit. I, I don't have the schema right in front of me. As we're saying, I mean, you have to follow. Uh, it, it can be complex just for the casual ver person looking at it. It, it. It's very clear to the facilities. We actually had no real complaints about those recommendations. They understand it quite well. Uh, and so I would really recommend that the family call the facility and they'll know exactly where they are and can tell when the visitors should be able to start. If the facilities had cases, then of course they have to start again in terms of their infection control um, and then retest, and then they'll be able to allow visitors. If they would have an infection, it sounds like, in my reading of it, it would be another four weeks. If they had one infection, it would be another four weeks until they were at the point it, where they could have a visit. It could again. be several weeks, but we ha I mean, it, it is a balance between protecting the, the public health and protecting the health of the individuals in the facility versus the, allowing the visitors. And I know that it, it, it's a really difficult balance, but we cannot introduce COVID-19 in the facility. And then just to clarify, for the personal care and assisted living, that kind of that clock 
actually couldn't begin before the end of August, right? Well, I mean, they're requ they can do their testing now. I mean, they are doing testing okay, so now. They can start moving. Oh, they, we wanted them to start way before. It's just that uh, because there are 1,900 facilities, um, we, uh, we we extended the deadline. Uh, for, for those facilities to accomplish that, but we didn't want them to wait to start. They knew very well beforehand uh, that they had to start the program. One now if they've done their testing. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Secretary, recently we talked about um, the Toronto Blue Jays coming to Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and how that was going to be a bad idea. Um, Toronto proper has just over 15,000 cases, and then Miami Dade in the last days jumped to 3,037 cases to a total of 110,352, which dwarfs the Pennsylvania State total. Uh, the Marlins now have an outbreak that's shutting down a couple of games of baseball. So if the Blue Jays weren't allowed to come because of the concern from a spot that's got less than 16,000 cases, how were the Marlins allowed to come to Philly with an area that's got over 110,000 sure. cases? So the, the, the Blue Jays were not... Um, asked to not come to Pittsburgh because they come from Toronto. It was just another team with more players and more staff that would be in Pittsburgh, which is an area um, that uh, that has been challenged in terms of a rising um, incidence of COVID-19 in terms of new cases. Now, this week that has stabilized, but um, by the time the decision was made, that was still rising. So it had nothing to do with, with, with Toronto. It had everything to do with yet another group of people who could uh, who could present a challenge. And in some ways, the fact that the Marlins have tested positive then, then it validates our decision not to add another team. I mean, why have the Pirates been allowed and the, and, and the Phillies been allowed in the first place? Because there are teams. Um, and so the decision was made that we that they are they are Pennsylvania teams. And so we would with the testing protocols um, uh, and all the different um, safeguards from uh, the the uh, the baseball league uh, that uh, we would have our teams play. But to add another team is just more risk. That was the reason. As a follow up, though, if, if you're bringing a team from an area that's one of the hottest spots on the globe, why would they be allowed to show up anyway? Well, so, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see, but um, that, those are the protocols that baseball has put into place. Um, uh, we, we can see the challenges of COVID-19 uh, th throughout the country, um, and so the decision was made, and eventually, finally, the governor made the decision that the baseball teams would be allowed to play, and we're going to follow the, uh, the, the rules of the Baseball Association. Yesterday, your office um, put out a statement that Philadelphia's health department would have owned the jurisdiction in those cases. Is yes, that is correct. Right. So is it come upon them to then set up the protocols for the Phillies above and beyond what you all are doing? And then it's the same thing for Allegheny County because of their health department. Mm -hmm. Well, their health departments have lead. Um, so with all of the county municipal health departments, they don't report to the Pennsylvania Department of Health. They have lead. Um, and so Dr. Farley and Dr. Bogan and, and the other commissioners of health for their health departments have lead in those localities. Yeah. I have just a couple questions about bars and restaurants. Uh, many lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, Democrats included, are asking you and the Wolf administration to roll back that 25% bar capacity, maybe restore it to 50% at least. Is this something we could see happen in the near future? And have you seen any impact on the cases from issuing that order almost two weeks ago? So it's, it hasn't been two weeks, and so it has to be a minimum of two weeks before you're going to see, to see an impact, because that's the, the uh, extent of the incubation period of the virus. So uh, we will see as this week progresses and next week in terms of whether that has been successful. There are no plans at this time uh, to roll that back. Um, because we have to wait and see. I mean, our case counts, I mean, we had uh, over 1,000 new patients today. So our case counts are still significant, and so we're going to have to see if, if those were effective. We won't know till the end of next week. The House uh, Policy Committee held a hearing today with uh, bar and restaurant owners regarding that order. I believe they asked you to participate, and I, I think you submitted some written testimony. That's correct. Declined to answer in-person questions. Why is that? Um, I just have a really busy day. I'm here, I'm other places, and so uh, we felt that it was sufficient to, and we wrote down all of what we, uh, uh, of what we needed to say, and we submitted written testimony. Yes? Uh, you mentioned LGBTQ people are not protected from discrimination under state law, including yourself, and I'm sorry, you have to deal with that. Um, there is a bill that would extend discrimination protections to LGBTQ, and it has been introduced, but it's languishing in committee that's chaired by a Republican. Um, how has prolonging these protections hurt the community during COVID? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think uh, it's hard for me to comment on specific um, uh, le uh, legislation, but there has been 
uh, comprehensive non-discrimination legislation that would include sexual orientation and gender identity introduced into the legislature, I believe, for 13 or 14 years, and it has never passed the legislature. Uh, um, I, I know that Governor Wolf is a strong supporter um, of comprehensive non-discrimination legislation and, depending, and, and would sign that, that type of bill. Uh, so I think it would be very important for the legislature to take that up and to pass that legislation. It's far beyond time that that, that be done. I think that, that there are many vulnerable groups um, in terms of, of COVID-19. I think that, that this global pandemic has, has shown us, has shown a bright light on, on health equity and health inequity. Um, I, I think that that's very clear in terms of communities of color. Um, in, in, in Pennsylvania, um, in urban, rural, and, sub, and, and suburban areas. And we have actually a health equity task force within the Department of Health. That health equity task force coordinates with the Lieutenant Governor's task force. And uh, we are, you know, we have a whole series of recommendations that we want to follow uh, for, for health equity for COVID-19 um, and beyond. And so that includes um, LGBTQ individuals. Yes. Just to follow up on that, do you think this particular climate has given people license to be so openly uh, critical of someone mm -hmm. and a group? You know, I think that that there are a number of reasons why people have been much more openly critical. I, I think that um, some of the actions in terms of the federal government has has triggered some of that. I mean, I think that uh, LGBTQ in, individuals federally have made a lot of progress in the previous administration. A lot of that has been rolled back. Um, the, uh, however, the, the, the victory in the Supreme Court a month ago was a tremendous victory in terms of non-discrimination in, in, in the workplace. But we can't stop there, and we have to we have to go forward with um, Pennsylvania legislation and even national legislation uh, for protection and uh, non-discrimination, including sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, the other is I think that people are very, very stressed, and, and I think that I don't blame them. I mean, we're in the middle of the biggest global pandemic since 1918. Uh, this, is, this has hit every country of the world. It has hit the United States extremely hard, including Pennsylvania. You only have to look every day at the news, at the numbers that we see in Florida and Alabama, uh, um, in Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, um, uh, Arizona, uh, coming up, uh, Georgia, South North Carolina. Um, you can see the, the, the numbers of new cases, which have been which have been extremely large, and uh, and then the the impact of COVID-19 in Pennsylvania. So I think that people are stressed. Um, I have met, I have said many times that I think that that uh, when people don't understand something and they're very stressed, uh, they can react with anger. Um, and anger can lead to hate, and hate can lead to the dark side of the force. You know, I, I think that, that, that all of that um, is, is related to some of what we've seen. Um, but that's, it, it, I mean, th there might be reasons for it, but there's no excuse for it. And so today, my call was for, uh, was for tolerance, um, was for acceptance and welcoming of, of everyone in terms of the amazing tapestry of diversity in our Commonwealth. I'd like to ask you about the testing. You know, obviously, there's been a lot of criticism about the allowing patients back into nursing homes. Do you think this kind of testing earlier would have saved lives in Pennsylvania? And again, this is just a snapshot. How sure. long do you do this kind of testing? Well, we're going to continue. So this is going to be a video. I mean, this is going to continue. So we don't have one test and then we're done. And so we are actively working on what are the protocols will be, the individualized protocols for facilities uh, to, to uh, nursing homes to retest. We have to continue to do that. Now, the retesting protocols uh, in a county that has a lot of cases like um, Allegheny County or Philadelphia or, or Delaware County is going to be different than if it's in Bradford County. So uh, we'll have individualized testing protocols, but they're going to have to continue to retest. It's not a one-time thing. Um, so uh, yes, but it was impossible to do this type of testing in April. Um, uh, certainly in March, uh, but in April and even May. Um, the, the testing supplies were not available. Uh, the testing resources were not available to do, um, you know, probably over 100,000 or more tests, 80, 84, 85,000 patients and the residents and then all the staff. And to accomplish that, we did not have the testing capacity. We do have that testing capacity now, and that's why we actually um, asked them to do it in starting in May and then ordered it in June uh, to, be, to, to be completed now. Um, there are challenges in testing capacity now throughout the country, and we spoke about that last week, is that uh, because of the amount of tests being generated throughout the country, 
the national testing companies, LabCorp, Quest, et cetera, have significant waiting times to get results. Um, and there are starting to be some shortages of reagents for specific testing platforms. Uh, we actually had a call with, with, with many of the hospitals, and some of them uh, are looking for those reagents and chemicals. Uh, we don't have them, um, and we have to go to the companies uh, to see if we can uh, to see if Pennsylvania can get them. So we will be doing that, uh, but we don't control that supply of, of, of the chemicals and reagents. So, uh, but we're going to continue to test um, all of the nursing homes, and then we're, we're continuing that process to test all of the other long-term care living facilities. Yes. Regarding the return to education, is there a certain case threshold that the departments of health and education are looking at when making the decision mm -hmm. whether whole classes in person or online instruction? Uh, so we had a great discussion yesterday uh, with many stakeholders um, in education. Uh, so this is a collaboration uh, with our partners, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, uh, with uh, the, the Department of Health and other agencies, and of course the governor's office. We spoke with the legislature yesterday. We spoke with the superintendents yesterday. We spoke with other stakeholders stakeholders yesterday. Um, uh, so we're looking at all of the data. Uh, I do not have a specific metric. Uh, I know the governor of New York put out a, a, a metric in terms of percent positivity. Um, my concern with having one specific data point is, is that it doesn't take into consideration different things that might be involved in a county. Uh, so you might have a rural county that has increases uh, due to a, a farm with migrant workers with no children there. That probably doesn't need to influence whether schools are open, but it certainly will increase the case counts and it'll increase the percent positivity. Uh, that might be true of a, of, a, of a prison, of a federal prison or a state prison, which really won't influence the, 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 whether schools should open or not. So we're going to have to do a deeper dive on that. So our team is looking at that really, really carefully. But I'm not going to have a number that if the percent positivity is greater than that, there's, there's no school. And if it's less than that, there is school. And how close to the school year will this decision be made? Well, we're working with the schools now. So again, it's, it, it, we're going to be looking at all of the data. You know, we look at, and we've discussed what data we look at. We look at the number of cases, new cases in a, in a, in a county or in an area. We look at the cases per capita. That's the incidence rate. We look at percent positivity. We do deep dives into these counties and look and see, is, is this a specific outbreak? maybe on a farm, maybe in a prison, maybe in a nursing home. Is that going to influence the kids? And so we're going to continue to do that, and we'll be working with each superintendent to, to make the best decision for their area. Yes? I have two questions on different topics. Sure. First, um, do you feel that the public response to the online post has been adequate? Um, for example, I know the mayor of Hellam uh, responded against a post that was made by the Hellam Recreation Department. Do you feel supported by other public officials? Um, I, I feel supported by other public officials. I feel supported by the governor. Uh, and Governor Wolf is the strongest, best ally uh, we, we could possibly have in the LGBTQ community. But I think that, that one statement isn't enough. This is a process. This is not one apology or one statement of support and we're done. This is a process. And for example, the governor has been supportive of the LGBTQ community before he was elected and then after he was elected in the first term and in the second term. And you could look at the progress we've made, the LGBTQ commission, uh, et cetera. So this is a continuous process. And so I would call upon all those public officials and, 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 uh, and everyone to continue to work towards not just tolerance, but to create an accepting and welcoming environment for LGBTQ individuals. Okay. And uh, my second question is just about nursing homes. Um, you say that you're 98% uh, towards the uh, federal uh, state testing. No, we're, we're, we did 100% of the testing. Uh, the, the federal government asked us in terms of surveying, and we'll be there by the end of the week. Inspections, yeah. excuse me. Um, however, the reports on those don't come out until 41 days after they're completed. Why are you allowing that uh, such a lag time, especially since people want to get back in? Um, that is that. That's not new. That that's the. I, I believe it's in regulation. I'll have to check that in terms of when we report results. I believe that's in the nursing home regulations, which we are revising, um, and uh, we'll, we're, we're going to work to have new regulations out uh, before the end of Governor Wolf's term. Regulation change takes a long time, but um, but th that's that's nothing new. It's always been that period of time. Yes. Yes. Uh, yesterday, the PIAA Sports Medicine Committee recommended that fall sports start on time. Were you consulted by that committee um, 
Yes or no, and then do you also support the return to sports at the high school level and fall sports on time? Um, I was not cons I, we spoke with that committee a week ago. So um, we spoke with PIAA and the, and the director a week, um, for me a week ago. I know that, that teams involving the Department of Health and the Pennsylvania Department of Education has had other contact with PIAA, it just wasn't me. I don't remember the last time they spoke. And we're going to be looking at, uh, as we've said, at all of the, those different pieces of data, um, in not only in terms of return to school, but also in, in terms of sports. So um, all of that is being, is being considered. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we have the, 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 the best data before, before those decisions are made. The point I want to make, however, is the best way that we can get kids back to school. The best way is for everyone to wear, if I can find it, a mask, right? Universal masking has been shown over and over again to decrease community spread of COVID-19. It is accepted throughout the country. Federal government uh, sends us reports every day in terms of recommending universal masking. And so what everybody can do is when you leave your door, Please put on a mask. If you're going to be in public in any way, outdoors or indoors, doesn't matter, please put on a mask. If you have to think about it, put on a mask. And that will help pre prevent community spread, help us decrease our case counts, and that would be the best way to help us get our kids back to school. That is, the time. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you each for coming. Thank you.